Okay, good evening. So we're recording this session. Tonight we've got, um, for tonight's leadership workshop session, it's in two acts. Uh, the first is project management and execution, facilitated by Ayush and Samika. Um, some of this material may be familiar to some of you, um, and some of it will be new. And so please remember, um, as I've shared at previous sessions, um, when we're in breakout rooms, when we're sharing out, um, those of you who have seen this material before and are more familiar with it, you have the opportunity to um, provide space for others to engage with it and to um, guide them along as well. Um, also, please remember, um, and, and, and I hope this would be apparent, but the stuff we're doing tonight isn't just for tonight. Um, Project management is is uh, something that we we do all the time in every meeting um, for everything we work on. And so keep in mind that we're just getting introduced to some of these skills today. Um, and we will have the opportunity to practice together and learn from each other and ask more questions throughout the preseason and the build season. But without further ado, um, I will introduce, I will let uh, Samika and Ayush take it away. Okay, cool. Thanks for coming, guys. This is the project management and execution portion of the leadership workshop today. There we go. Oh, no. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, we're going to start off with basically the definition of project management. So, project management is a process of leading the work of a team to achieve all project goals within the given constraints. Constraints are factors or limitations that can affect the planning, execution, and completion of a project. One thing that I want to make clear is that project management does not only apply to the project manager and FPM feature project managers. Each person on the team is their, is their own project manager, from leads to members. Each of you are always leading, whether it be the task that a lead assigned you or the task that you picked up from Trello. You are leading a team to achieve the project goal. Not only are you leading, but you're all an integral part of making sure that the team is able to achieve the project goals through participation and collaboration. So on this next slide, um, we're just gonna do a quick chat. Um, and so now that you know like the definition of project manager, what exactly constraint is, I want you guys to put in the chat of what is a project that you've led and what are some constraints you face within the project? Um, this does not have to be totally robotics related. It can be non-robotics related like the example. So. Um, like the project can be a history project that you're leading and the constraints are that you only have three days to complete it. Um, so in the chat, uh, if you guys can put in some examples of this and then we'll kind of go through it as they come in. Yeah, so again, it doesn't have to be totally robotics related. It can be it can be anything. All right, cool. Yeah, so I see some going. So install it. Heat exchanger constraints, overall dimensions, cost schedule, Spanish presentation, not everyone have the same amount of commitment. Um, rule of tiers pre-scouting, that's a good one, uh, with the constraints being that um, I've never done it before uh, in the meeting before. Yeah, so these are all really good examples of kind of in not just being a project manager to kind of experience like the, the roles and skills of a project manager and having to kind of given a project and kind of working with the constraints. Yeah, so now before we dive into the objective of project management, um, what are some goals that you guys think that we have as a team? You guys can raise your hand or put them in the chat and try to think big on this.
yeah, build a competition ready robot, win a qualifier, be a world class robotics team. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, these are all great examples. And obviously, one of the biggest goals that we have as a team is to advance to the world championship. So, how do we um, achieve a goal like this? Well, we are working to build a highly participative team and a high performing team that continues to learn, contribute and have fun at the same time. So paying attention to detail, making sure our work is quality and not leaving loose ends. These all fall under our objectives of project management. And the ultimate goal of project management is to maximize a team's efficiency. So given the six week time period, we are bound to build our robot without structure, it becomes increasingly difficult to achieve all the tasks we have laid out for the season. Even with structure, there are always operations within our team that can be made better and more efficient. And finally, while we are focused on the goal, the key is the journey. A subset of maximizing efficiency is adapting to changing conditions. If our team is well-structured and scheduled, we should be able to maintain that efficiency as the robot th evolves throughout the course of the season. Yeah, so as Samik explained, one of the objectives of a project manager is to create goals. When we create goals as leaders, we want to create something called SMART goals, as many of you, as many of you may have heard. SMART goals stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. Your SMART goals determine what you want the end outcome of your project to be and what tasks will need, will need to be completed to achieve this goal. So an example of a not measurable goal would be we want to build a fast drivetrain. An example of a measurable goal would be in six weeks, we want to build a drivetrain that can move 14 feet per second. As you can see in the second option, um, in the second measurable goal, there is, is a, uh, there's a defined time frame and um, attainable goals attainable objects in the goal that can be met. Um, so in this next slide, we want you guys to quickly, and in your breakout rooms, which you'll be put into, we want you guys to pick a robot feature and envision three smart goals for your team. So a feature could be the drivetrain or an arm or anything that we've kind of built in the past years. Um, and so again, the example was what is not measurable. We want to build a fast car. Um, and a measurable goal would be a stationary car reaching 60 miles per hour in five seconds. Um, so this breakout will be um, four plus one. So again, you'll see that one minute kind of countdown, um, but you don't have to come back um, right away when you see that. All right, so I've got four rooms set up with a four plus one time. Uh, good to send people off? Yep. Yep. All right, here we go. All right, looks like everybody is back. Cool. So um, I hope you guys have some great conversation in your breakout rooms. Um, so I'm going to ask if at least at least two or three uh, breakout rooms could share, like, what are what is a feature that you guys chose and some smart goals that you guys made uh, for your feature? Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Uh, we decided to do a flywheel shooter. And the goals we made were we wanted to build a flywheel that could fire twice in one second with about 80% accuracy, so four and five land. Um, we want it to be able to fire on up to a 60 degree angle so that we can have a variety of different uh, angles we can use depending on where we are in the given game. And probably able to fire a good 15, 20 feet to cover those angles as well. Cool, yeah, those are all all really good. Uh, anyone else? At least one more. One more breakout room. Yeah, go ahead, Franklin. Uh, we didn't get all three, but we did uh, like last year's arm, and we said that some of our goals were that we wanted to be able to within one second like reach the shelf and then like the high node to score, and that. We also wanted to be able to survive like some number of matches without having any failures, like anything breaking. Those are good, yeah. All specific. And then Jake, you wanna wanna end it off? Last one. Yeah, so we we chose within software, we chose to do like vision. Um, and so our first goal was like implementing uh over like a two week period of time 
implementing our new whatever it's either it's like North Star or Photon, implementing the new version of that um, and testing to make sure that it works. Um, then our second goal was uh, trying to tune it and threshold it to a point where we can like be reliable from like over like a meter and a half, um, considering we were only at like a meter last year. Um, and then our third one was um, implementing it so that way we could like be reliable like um consistently on the move like when we're doing like auto pass and stuff like that yeah good job everyone those are those are all really specific and all follow the smart goals um and as you can see the reason we make these smart goals is it helps us when we go to plan and organize what tasks that we want to do it helps us um kind of be able to do kind of create specific tasks also the goals that we want some okay so now we're going to talk a little bit about data collection and prototyping, but before we do, we have a little skit. All right, you ready? Yeah. All right, cool. Hey, Sam, did you run the test on the prototype for the shooter feature last night? Yes, I did. Great. Did you remember to record the test data for how fast the shooter was? I looked in our team's folder and I couldn't find it. Yeah, I ran some tests and I noted down the measurements. That's awesome. Can I see it? Yes, it's on my phone. I put it on my notes app last night. Oh, well, I thought we agreed you were going to make a Google spreadsheet with recorded measurements and put it in our team's folder so that everyone can see. Yes, but this was just so much easier. I was running the tests and my phone was right there, so I just put it on my phone. Yes, but when you do it that way, no one else knows where the results are and which prototype design should we select for our final submission. Can you please make a structured test results sheet and record all your results in there and put it in our team's folder? Yeah, that makes sense. I'll do that now. Thanks for the reminder. So as you guys um, could tell by that skit, proper organized documentation for prototyping is incredibly important. And um, whether you're an FPM, you're a lead, or you're just a member, it's really important that you guys are putting it in a place that all of us can see it, because this is important data that we're going to be using when we decide um, how exactly we want to design our robot. Um, so when prototyping, it's really important that your design looks to answer specific questions as efficiently as possible. And the FPMs will be the ones that are in charge of creating and managing the spreadsheet, but it's important that everyone knows how to conduct this. So I'm just going to show you guys a quick example of what a spreadsheet might look like. So this is actually from two years ago for Sierra. Um, and as you guys can see on this spreadsheet, I don't know if it's fully loaded, but all of the features are on this. So this is actually the intake uh, prototyping, but there's also the shooter um, and then some other prototyping data as well. Um, so up here in the top, you guys can see the specific things that we were testing for and then all of the data we collected. And this just makes it incredibly easy um, for us to see all of the different data we have. And we highlighted the one that we ended up going with. So yeah, this is. Um, incredibly important and it makes it super easy for it to be uh, transparent among all of us and um, easy for discussion when we are designing our robot. So with this, how do we actually find the questions that are going to be answered? Um, this is the shooter prototyping doc from two years ago um, that had a bunch of questions that we were looking to answer. Um, so some of the questions that were discussed were the motor speed, the compression, the exit velocity, the angle, and more. So um, in this document, you can see that we were uh, being specific and detailed about what exactly we found, whereas the sheet was just a place for us to record our data and just see the numbers. Um, so each season, our design process often starts with a set of design questions that need to be answered. And this is really connected to project management because our ultimate goal is to have a product at the end, which in our case is a robot. And we want this to match the product owner's uh, requirements, which is usually the strategy team. Um, and we also wanted to fulfill our own requirements as a team in order to achieve our goals. And prototyping serves as a great way to check in and make sure that the ideas we're coming up with and the work we're doing matches these goals. Okay. And then 
for is it loading properly okay um so for our team structure i'm going to run through it pretty briefly um we have four captains that each lead their own branch with multiple leads in each branch and we also have additional roles such as a scouting lead and impact presentation team that fall under specific branches um, in terms of the people that uh, usually lead the execution of our robot, we have the robot captain, the sys, and the FPMs, while our project manager is leading our whole team, all branches included, through efficient execution. Uh, why are we showing you guys this? Well, uh, what we want you to take away is that we want to make sure that our team is organized so that we're able to have an effectively run team by leading from behind. Um, and this is something that is very critical to project management as a whole. So what exactly does leading from behind really mean? Um, while our leadership team is the backbone of our team, we can't forget our goals towards sustainability and spreading knowledge among the whole team. So as a result, some responsibilities of FPMs and leads include um, looking broadly, so keeping the end in mind and looking at how we can be more efficient as a whole. Um, this also means not always actively being involved in all tasks and cards as leads and FPMs. It's important that we are delegating and that we're properly training our members in order to um, allow them to fulfill the task by themselves with just us overseeing. Um, and with that, trying to have participation from all team members. Um, this is obviously really important because especially for our newer members, our underclassmen, we wanna make sure that we are spreading our knowledge and keeping the sustainability and high performance of this team. Um, and then we also want to look ahead for what's coming up and line things up for efficiency and execution. So again, this isn't just the job of the project management sub team. This falls on all of the leads and all of the members to kind of look back uh, think about the end and how we can work backwards to um, efficiently execute the design of our robot. Um, and then also, while usually documentation, data collecting, all of that um, falls into the hands of the future project manager, we also want to encourage members to assist in that documentation and data collecting and give everyone the opportunity to see what it's like to really manage a project and lead um, the creation of it. So in the past slides, we went over a more broad overview of what project management is. Now we're going to dive into the specifics, starting with Agile. An important part of the project management is the methodology or structure you use to stay organized. One of the most popular of these is the Agile methodology. The Agile methodology refers to a set of values, principles, and practices for project management that prioritizes flexibility, collaboration, and customer satisfaction. Its purpose is to create a flexible, iterative, and collaborative approach to project management an approach that is able to adapt to the changing requirements like a robotics team. The Agile Manifesto is a concise statement of Agile that captures the core values and principles of Agile. It is divided into four key values, which are individuals and interactions over processes and tools. This means having regular conversations with members and checking in on them and each other instead of using reflection forms or other means. Working solutions over comprehensive documentation. This does not mean you should not create documentation. Rather, you should create documentation that provides value and does not hinder the team's progress. Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. If something seems like it doesn't work or something is bothering you, talk up. Talk to a lead, captain, or coach so that we can find a better way to move forward. And the last one is responding to change by following a plan. If we realize that we read the, read the rule book wrong and we're not able to build the feature how we want, we are able to respond to this by change instead of being stuck with our original plan and just making it work. These four key values are meant to act as a guiding principles when utilizing Agile on the team. Scrum on the other hand is a framework that is built off the Agile methodology. Scrum is a more specific and focused process that is built on the four values in the Agile methodology. Like, like Agile, it has core values that it works off of. In Scrum, these are transparency, inspection, and adaption, which are all held together by trust. Moving to the specifics of the Scrum framework, there are three key roles in Scrum. These roles are the project owner, the product owner, who represents the interests of stakeholders and is responsible for defining and prioritizing the product backlog. At Husky Robotics, the product owner is Ian, our strategy captain. He, re he represents the client or the game in the case. Our Scrum Master, uh, the next one is a Scrum Master, who facilitates the Scrum process, removes impediments, and ensures that the team follows Scrum practices. 
At Husky Robotics, this would be our feature project, man or feature project managers. And lastly, the development team. The development team is a cross-functional self-organizing group responsible for delivering the product increment. The development team at Husky Robotics is all of us, the members who work on completing the task. Tasks that are needed to be completed are called user stories within the Scrum framework. User stories are co a concise description of a piece of functionality or a feature from an end user's perspective, a feature that needs to be implemented. These user stories can be broken down into further, further into subtasks to make them more manageable and attainable tasks. These user stories are then sorted in the product backlog by priority to the organization. These user stories are then tracked and managed through the four main events that take place over a specified period of time or a sprint. The first event is sprint planning. At the beginning of each sprint, the, team's plan the team plans the work to be completed during the sprint. User stories from the product backlog are assigned to members of the team and stories are also placed within the sprint backlog, which is a list that carries stories that may be completed later in the sprint. This is also where the definition of done is determined. The definition of done is a set criteria that must be met for a product backlog item to be considered complete. The team will also set the sprinkle or what they want to achieve during the sprint. The next event in the in Scrum is the daily Scrum or the standout. The daily Scrum is a brief daily meeting where team members discuss progress, plans, and roadblocks that they are facing during the sprint. At the end of the sprint, the team holds a sprint review. This is where the team presents the completed work to stakeholders for feedback. Also then is a sprint retrospective. The sprint retrospective is a meeting at the end of the, each sprint where the team reflects on its performances and identifies areas of improvement. So how does this all come together? So remember that Agile is a guide or framework or for frameworks such as Scrum. These processes are meant to be adapted and tweaked to fit the needs of individual businesses and teams. Here at Husky Robotics, we use a Scrum framework which is built off the principles of Agile with a couple of changes to fit our schedule and needs. Um, so here is a diagram of the Husky Robotics process framework, um, which is built off the principles of Scrum. So our season starts off with kickoff in early January, we'll, where we will get the game for the season. This kickoff will lead to the creation of a six-week high-level build plan. This plan is then made into user stories and put into our project backlog. They are organized with Trello labels of different colors to show which subteams they pertain to. These tasks are not prioritized within the product backlog, but rather in the sprint and sometimes individually by subteams and FPMs. Each user story contains a specific title on what the task the card is responsible for, as well as a label for which subteam feature it belongs to. Within stories are tasks. These tasks lay out the steps of what specific things need to be completed for the story to be considered ready for the done list. Once the team completes all the tasks in the story, it is placed in the done list and is assessed during the daily standups. Because we have such a short build season, our sprints are only one week long. Our sprints will end on Saturday at 2, where all the leads will reflect upon our previous sprint in a sprint retrospective meeting. This includes reviewing our past goal to see if we met it, reviewing the done list, and reflecting on any processes that could make our sprints more effective and any concerns that the leads have. This meeting is also our planning meeting for our next sprint, which starts on Monday. Tasks from the previous sprint that were not completed are moved to the next sprint and the project backlog is reviewed to move any tasks that we plan to complete during the sprint. The new sprint goal, goal is created by the business, robot, and strategy branch as well. Within the sprint, our daily stand-up meetings are held during each dinner on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and lunch on Saturday. This is where we discuss progress plans and roadblocks. This is also where we review the done list. The done list is assessed here because different people have different definitions and conceptions of what done means. So it's always important to make sure the task is truly completed and thought to be completed by everyone on the team. Then on Saturday, the whole process is repeated again. This continues for the length of the build season, each week a new sprint. There we go, okay. Um, as Ayush mentioned, having a high level build season schedule allows us to create a targeted plan for all of our features and give us a guideline for managing our time and workload. A high-level build schedule is very crucial to our team, and though it shows things in very general terms and very large groupings, without it, we would lack important information for the direction and dictation of our stories and goals. So I'm going to quickly go over this, and then you guys are going to get in breakout rooms and fill out a couple of these yourself. Um, so 
going, uh, what goes into actually making a high level build season schedule? Some common strategies to keep in mind are starting with the end in mind. I said that a lot today. Um, it's really important that we know our overall goal and then we work backwards from there. Um, and a big emphasis this year is on prioritization and parallel work. So thinking about what can be done in parallel and how we can utilize this time. Um, so for example, as you guys can see for the drivetrain, uh, we have fabricating and assembly in week three, and we actually get into some software stuff in week four, um, but then we come back to assembly to integrate with the other features. So just kind of like not letting other features hold you back and kind of continuing to move forward is incredibly important as well. Um, and yeah, it's important to be ambitious and driven, but rushing leads to mistakes and those can be detrimental if they cause a robot to act up at the wrong time and will overall, uh, slow us down. So while we are trying to be ambitious and finish our robot by week six, which is one of the goals of ours, uh, we still want to make sure that we're, um, put making high, high quality features and a high quality robot. Um, so as you guys go into your breakout rooms, we're going to ask you guys to fill out the uh, high level build schedule for each of the weeks. Um, if you expand, you can see what exactly is happening each day or what we expect to. Um, for the sake of this uh, breakout room, you guys are not going to be filling out the days in between, um, just the overall weeks. And again, remember, we are trying to have a robot for drive team um, by week six. So keep that in mind and also think about how um, we can kind of spread out um, where each feature is going so we're not overloading any sub teams. Um, so then, yeah, this is, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, and then before you guys go into your breakout rooms, um, so group one will obviously be that first, um, will be the intake, group two would be arm, group three would be manipulator, and then group four um, would be strategy. So. You guys can just, you don't need to make a copy of the sheet. You can use um, the sheet that we provided and just edit it. Ayush, I have group, I have room one set up for strategy. Sorry. Oh, I'll okay. Okay, backwards. so then we'll just do it backwards. And so strategy will be group one, um, manipulator would be group two, um, group three would be arm, and then breakout group four would be intake. Cool. Good to open. Is everyone yes. able to edit the sheet? Are you guys able to edit it? Yeah, no? Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think they are. Yes. Yep. All, right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Five minutes, four plus one, still good? Um, mm. I, Let's do I seven think maybe... plus one. Let's do eight minutes for this one. Got it. Okay, cool. Here we go. All right, looks like everybody is back. Okay, awesome. This is some good stuff um, that we're looking at. Um, but I did wanna ask, does anyone see just by looking at how each of the features have laid out uh, the six weeks of build season, does anyone see anything that might be a constraint or a risk for our team in being efficient with our execution. You can raise your hand. We're looking for like two or three people maybe to share. Yeah, Franklin. Um, I noticed that like in weeks four and five, all of the features go to assembly and electrical. We don't want to overload like sub teams too much. So mm -hmm. it would be nice to try to spread out, like maybe get drivetrain like into electrical before all the other features. So then there's more people in bandwidth to do other features, I think. Yeah, definitely. That's a good one. And another thing that we actually I'll I'll talk after. Yeah, I'll let them go ahead. Um I don't know. If this is clarified, but there is, there are two types of assembly. I feel like the, um, like assembling the actual feature and assembling all the features together. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's like accounted for in this. Yeah, 
all of these like beginning ones are like initial assembly. And then by week five, we start to see like integration for the whole robot. Yeah, that's, that's important to know. Um, Aaron? On strategy, um, the biggest uh, restriction we have is uh, design requirements need to be done in some capacity by the end of the first week. Mm -hmm. And so that there's only like little edits to do by the end of week two, and they need to be done, done by the end of week two. Yeah, that's definitely a big one. Strategies get a lot on their plate right, right at the start to get those design requirements out. Um, yeah, this is all really good. It just gives us a chance to kind of see how it's really easy for all of the features to start overloading subteams. Um, which is why it's incredibly important to, again, start at the end and kind of look at the bigger picture. Um, because when we create a build season planning sheet like this one, we're able to see that we can't be overloading subteams or else we're not going to be as efficient as we possibly can. Um, yeah, some really good stuff. Like I know last year, one big thing we did was we had electrical um, kind of sit with us through the design process, which sped up the electrical process a lot. And they kind of knew what they were doing going into it. Um, and like assembling the drivetrain early, giving it to software to do some testing and then coming back. Um, yeah, those are all good things that we can definitely implement in the build season to make us um, more efficient and reach our goal of finishing the robot by week six. Yeah, another organizational tool um, that we introduced last year was the team, availabil the team availability sheet. Uh, the team availability, availability sheet is a resource that we created to better organize our team and help with planning. The sheet helps provide transparency and availability of team members. Um, as a reminder, this is not an attendance sheet. It's a resource that we hope will help when it comes to planning, as team members can see when someone they may need in a meeting or to complete a task is available or not. Um, so, Smig, if you click on the link... And we can. Well, and then we click on software. Yeah. Yeah. Once it loads. Um, but um, if you look at the software, something that we will see eventually that each day we meet in the build season and listed on the top with the name of each member on the sub team. On the left is the timing of the weekday meeting in 30 minute increments. And if we scroll all the way to the right, we can see that there's a different Saturday timing um, for our Saturday meetings. Cool. Yeah. And then going back to Monday, <laughs> if we take a look at Matthew um, in week one, we can see the green signifies when he's available and the red from 6.30 to 9 signifies when he's not available. So if a leader FPM needed Matthew's help during these times or during the day, they can see that when they can use Matthew and when Matthew will not will not be available. Again, this is a tool that we hope will help during the build season when it comes to planning, um, designing when planning design meetings or planning other events. Cool. So that is it. Cool. So that is it for us. Um, when it, in terms of project management, um, if you guys have oh actually never mind I skipped the slide. <laughs> My bad. One more. <laughs> Um, okay, so real quick, um, we just wanted to talk about what you guys kind of see in the difference between these two pictures. Like, what does your, uh, what do your eyes focus on in the picture on the left and um, on the right? And you guys can just quickly put in the chat or raise your hand. Yeah, so left is the whole dartboard and the right is specifically the bullseye. Um, so yeah, on the left, there is a lot in the picture and you can really focus on anything, the bricks, the numbers, um, the darts, whatever you want to. But on the right, it's really honed in on the bullseye and we have a clear goal of what we want. 
Um, in terms of our team, obviously this bullseye is worlds for us and project management is key to reaching our target. And in order to achieve our bullseye, we have to all be looking ahead at our season and preparing to meet our goals. So we want to build a highly focused team and along with worlds, we're working to be more transparent and efficient. Um, it falls on all of us, lead or not, to be participative. And this means highlighting risks and constraints you see, regardless of whether they apply to your sub team or your tasks. And in addition, there's always work to be done. So um, there's so many ways to be involved and definitely reach out if you guys um, need work and help us move our team forward. So yeah. That is all we've got for the project management part. You guys have any questions before we hand it over to Mr. John? Yeah, again, if you guys do have any questions after this meeting, be feel feel free to uh, Google chat either one of us, Mika or me. Yeah. Thank you guys. Okay, cool. Thank you. So yeah, that's good. Thank you. And uh, for this half of the lesson, yes, there is a new set of handouts. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, would you be able to resend that? Will do. Thank you, Aaron, for asking that question. All right, I'm no longer going to be looking at the chat, so uh, we will get started here. Uh, thank you, Samika and Ayush, for stepping us through how Huskies do project management. Next, we will be stepping into risk and FAMICA, or failure mode effects and criticality analysis. My thanks to Mr. MG, who put together the past few years of risk and failure analysis. I am standing on the shoulders of giants by stealing liberally from the work he has previously done. Now, part of this presentation is based on FAMICA slides published by the author at this link. Uh, wherever Mr. MG or I inserted other internet sourced information, we also included the source uh, in line. So last year, we went to the World Championship competition. Helena was our systems integration specialist at the time, and she graciously allowed me to share this, her end of competition post to the team. I'll do my best, Helena, which will not be very good. Something I wanted to highlight. Although everyone experienced varying levels of satisfaction with our world's experience, I wanted to emphasize how cool it is that although a lot of today's playoff matches seem to be determined by technical robot issues, throughout the season, we never or rarely encountered preventable robot failures, such as browning out, roboreal electrical connection issues, consistent vision failure, or tipping, which, shows how much we've grown since last season and directly learned from our mistakes, as well as developing successful risk mitigation strategies such as FAMICA. So shout out to everyone for that. When I take the liberty to summarize her words, I come up with the following agenda for this training. We will talk about the relationship between risk and the goal of never encountering preventable robot failures. Next, I'll share the three ideas of how we can reach that goal, growing as a team, learning from our mistakes, and using successful risk mitigation strategies like FAMICA Plus. Finally, we'll talk about celebrating the outcome as we take steps towards our goal of no preventable robot failures. So how can we never encounter preventable robot failures? It would seem like a lofty goal if we hadn't achieved it last season. Now, we're talking about risk in this part of the training. We always have the risk of a preventable robot failure. What we will be focused on today is identifying those risks and figuring out how to reduce both the frequency of preventable failures occurring and or the severity of those failures. We should recognize that we will need to take some risks if we want to both eliminate preventable robot failures and have a competitive bot by the time of the first competition. For instance, while keeping safety in mind, we need to take risks 
in order to find ways to meet the game outcomes that we want to meet. We need to take risks to meet the requirements that we set up for ourselves after kickoff. We need to take significant risks in developing different prototypes to find which one will work and what we can learn from those that fail. We don't want to do detailed engineering on our prototypes. We just want to see if different concepts can work. As an example, check out this very janky looking but very purposeful prototype. You can see a cobbled together collector frame. You can see the handheld drill running the collector in the back. You can see the human hands that are feeding the power cells into the collector. You can see a couple of clamps just kind of holding the collector in place on top of the bumpers. But wait, what's that? Is there some wood under the prior year's bumper to get the correct height for the wheel clearance? And is the collector being held at an angle because of that extra piece of wood on top of the bumper? Did somebody do some quick prototype risk analysis to understand that we needed to determine the proper compression on the power cell so they made sure we could vary the height during testing? This is an example of taking some risk to quickly prove a concept while also reducing the risk that we will not get actionable information from the test. Now, back to our goal of no preventable robot failures. To reach this, we will need to report and capture risks. So when do we need to report potential risks? Safety risks should be reported and acted on whenever you see them. There is no need to rip up a perfectly good epidermis or apply blunt force trauma to any body parts. Mr. Schmidt and I have already helped out in first aid on both of those. As for the process, we should aim to capture the majority of the risks at the beginning before we go too far down the road and waste time and resources building something that will not meet our goal. However, we still want to collect and analyze risks in the rest of our process too. Let's take a minute and share in the chat the answer to this question. What are some things in the process from part drawing creation through to drive practice that could be considered a risk? So what are some things in the process between part drawing creation all the way through to drive practice that could be considered a risk. Please put it in the chat. Not wearing proper equipment during machining, such as safety glasses, maybe even earplugs, depending. That's a risk, it's a personal safety risk. What other kind of risks do we have? Designing a part that we can't manufacture. Running new software that could break newly assembled features. That would be bad. <laughs> Electrical not being part of the design process. Oh, parts getting lost or made incorrectly. Not saying enable or enabling before enabling the robot. A carpal tunnel for the mechanicalers. <laughs> Dropping the robot off the robot cart. Ooh, swapping red and black wires when wiring electronics. All sorts of risks. So we have to be on the look for a lot of those risks as we go through. Luckily, we already have some of those kinds of items have been de-risked through methods that we still have to remember to use. But thank you for that. So let's talk about the first how to never encounter preventable robot failures. We have done some really excellent growing as a team over the past few years. 
A good deal of that growth can be attributed to Husky's focus on playing two games at once. This was discussed earlier in servant leadership training. If we maintain a balance of playing both this year's game and next year's game, then we will not get into the position we were in many years ago where only the seniors knew how to design and assemble the robot and nobody else was allowed to touch it. When they graduated, we were starting over. This happened for many years. As Husky culture changed, we have now gotten to the point where we routinely have younger team members working on the robot and running important portions of projects, just like Samika and Ayush were talking about needing everybody to be able to run different parts of projects. Two portions of this are the new member training that Huskies does during the fall semester and the use of Agile and Scrum that we just learned about. These tools help new members and members with newer responsibilities to perform better when the build season starts in January. I'd like to propose a new tool that I call helping everyone to be comfortable pointing out risks. You actually already have been tra trained on the basics of this. Allow me to show you what I mean. Do you remember this slide from servant leadership training? Remember, everyone on the team can be a servant leader. If a team member is concerned about the safety of what we were doing, or the time that it will take to get this thing done, or the robot performance after we do this thing, that will present as an interruption or an obstacle. A servant leader will find out what the problem is and determine a path to get it resolved. Wouldn't it be great if that path included the member who brought up the concern, perhaps working with someone else? That grows our team and prepares us even more for next year. You could proactively use the accountability conversation to make sure that you and the other member are aligned on the task. Always remember to summarize the who does what by when and how you will follow up with each other. All right, we've made it through the first how. Now let's talk about the second how to never encounter preventable robot failures. In the corporate world, we make mistakes all the time. We document many of them and we share them with others so that they don't have to learn the same mistake the hard way. For Huskies, this looks like Trello reference and stand-up meetings during meals. Consider just how much more we could share than we do today during those stand-up meetings and demos. For those who aren't sure what I'm talking about, allow me to share a couple of examples. The first is our reference board on Trello. There are all sorts of references and standards in the Trello reference depository. Make sure that you spend some time in here before the build season, understanding the details for your sub team. You should also understand at least a little bit of your supplier sub team and your customer sub team. Who's your supplier? Who's your customer? If you get parts or information from somebody, they are your supplier. If you give parts or information to somebody else, they are your customer. The second example that I want to share with you was a demo shared in our stand-up meeting a couple of years ago. Here we have a strong lock nut and the gear teeth have failed. When we bend or break things or spend way too much time trying to get something to fit, we should be sharing that with a lead or an FPM, a feature project manager, so that they can share during demos. Remember, more people can learn from our mistakes if we share them. We are now on to the third how to never encounter preventable robot failures, using successful risk mitigation strategies like Famica Plus. 
Remember that link about 16 slides ago to the slides related to the book? These two quotations came from one of the slides. Take a minute to read through. I think that the big takeaway here is that Omdahl was thinking about Famica before I even graduated high school. The second takeaway is that Famica is a proven process to stop potential problems from happening. So first we will talk about the industrial grade Famica, failure mode, effects, and criticality analysis. This tool will help you to find and determine the ways that different parts of a system could fail, how the failure will affect the performance of the system, and what we can do to keep the potential critical failures from affecting the operation of the system. And whenever I talk about a system, think robot or think feature, because those are both systems. Let's talk about defining the failure mode before we get to those critical failures. So we are just about to do a breakout room, so make sure you've got your brain ready. A highly technical definition of failure mode is on the screen. This basically means that the thing you designed didn't get the job done. As part of defining the specific failure, you also want to include the operational mode. For us, we can consider if the collector is collecting or is waiting, deployed or not deployed, or if the robot is running in automatic, or if the driver is in control for teleop. For a real world example, Consider when someone has tied their shoelaces, but the knot came undone. If they trip, their operational mode matters. Falling in the grass might not be a problem, but what if they are the ones carrying the robot onto the field? The same effect occurs to the person in either one they lose their balance and potentially fall. But there's a major difference on the effect on what they were trying to do. They could fall, get grass stains, and potentially get injured, versus they could fall and potentially get injured, plus have potential robot damage. All right, here is your breakout room information. Each of your breakout rooms will have a feature project manager, system integration specialist, project manager or driver there to assist if there are any questions, though they should refrain from taking the lead. I'd like you to consider the vision camera mount for last year's robot. And I'd like you to consider the operational modes as being auto and teleop, the driver controlled version. What could fail with the vision camera mount? And what would this failure cause in the vision system? I gave you an idea of the vision system function. And how would the failure affect the function of the robot, the full system? So go through those three questions, first for auto and then for teleop. Make sure to choose someone to report out and remember, we will have the four plus one minute countdown in the breakout room. Ready when you are, Mr. Schmidt. All right, here we go. Thank you. All right, it looks like everybody is back. Very good, thank you. All right, so uh, can we get some hands up? I'd love to have uh, two or three people report out. All right, Aaron, Andrea, Jake, Aaron, go ahead. Um, for number one, we said what could fail is the camera could break, the camera cap could be left on, it could be out of focus. I think those are the three that we've come up with, yeah. Um, two was 
Any failure in the camera would cause the robot to not be able to tell where it is on the field. So basically it just can't see. And three is without the camera, we would not be able to score in autos very well because that is when we are most dependent on it. Okay. Thank you very much. Andrea. So we started from just the mount and said, like, if it fell off, it, then the robot wouldn't be able to see April tags, um, which then means it can't align to score. We also said, like, if it falls off completely, the camera could get run over on the field by another robot. All right. Very good. Jake. Um, so we noted that, uh, most recently the camera has been prone to fail via the Raspberry Pi, whether that's the connection or the Pi itself. Um, so noting that that is, uh, what could fail with it. Um, the failure would cause within auto us to not be able to accurately run an auto. We'd still be able to run it and would probably score at least one piece, but we couldn't confidently get to the other pieces as our pose is updated by uh, the camera consistently throughout 15 seconds. Um, but then once we would uh, reach teleop, um, we are not dependent on vision at that point. Um, and if need be, we can shut vision off uh, manually. Um, but what it would mainly restrict is Ian's ability to rotate on certain angles as he has a button that does that. Um, but the main failure uh, and the main problem would be during auto. Um, and I think one interesting thing to note is that when we're on field, we check each of our cameras before um, our matches. So that's kind of another way we're adding like failure management. We're checking them on field right before the match starts. So we're making sure that everything's running correctly beforehand. Very cool. All right. Well, and and thank you all uh, for, for responding on that. I, I especially like hearing that um, in 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 Jake's piece, it sounded like uh, one and two were the same for auto and teleop, but three is really where the failure affects the function of the robot, which is to score or to be able to drive in certain ways or you know for certain buttons to work to allow certain uh, certain things to happen. So uh, that's that's why when we're defining that problem, we have to understand what that operational mode is as well. All right, well, thank you all. Okay, so how do we determine what is a critical failure and what is not a critical failure? Well, we use spreadsheets. When we have written down the description of the failure and the effect of the failure on the robot's performance, we can then determine the failure rate or the occurrence on a scale of one to five. Next, we determine the severity ranking on a scale of one to 10. The spreadsheet multiplies the severity by the occurrence and gives us a criticality number. If the criticality number is greater than 18, then we need to take corrective action and redesign to reduce either the severity or the failure rate, the occurrence. If the criticality number is nine to 18 inclusive, then we should consider taking corrective action after first addressing the items greater than 18. If the criticality number is less than nine, it is acceptable to not take any action. Now, we can also quickly sort the items from highest criticality number to lowest criticality number using the filter so that we can see what it is that needs to be worked on first and make sure to go after the most important parts. So when determining how often the failure occurs, this is the scale that the team came up with last year. Mr. MG had provided a, uh, I, I keep, I kept wanting to say industry standard as I was writing this, but there is no one industry standard, but there's a lot of stuff that is, ooh, really almost exactly the same out there. And he provided us a beautiful version of one of those that was almost the same as everything else out there. And then 
he made this great statement, Huskies should make this their own. And they did. So nowhere out there in industry are you going to see a frequency of more than once per match or once per tournament or once per season. This is definitely an FRC Huskies frequency that was put together, and it's perfectly acceptable. Just as a comparison, I work in the chemical industry. We will design for once per 1,000 or once per 10,000 years to make sure that things don't go boom. The, when determining the severity of the failure, the team came up with these performance criteria. Now, there's well, notice that there's both performance and safety. The safety criteria are straight based off of industry. For instance, a, a critical safety failure, a seven, eight, or a nine, would result in a minor injury to a person. But we can see the performance goes from irreplaceable damage to the robot to a feature function is inhibited but not lost to at risk of penalty condition existing, uh, all the way down to we don't care. So the feature project managers and the system integration specialists are going to be the main people to use this process. So I'm not going to go through this specific slide in a lot of detail. However, anyone who is interested in the process can learn the basics by reading through this and can then talk to an FPM, the SIS, or me for more information. Please note, though, that this is an iterative process of improvement. The FAMICA spreadsheet will be able to capture the history of the improvement, like a change log. Also note that only an engineering corrective action, a, a redesign, will cause us to change the severity and the occurrence. So it's hard to fix a bad architecture or strategy or fundamental design approach after you have started the assembly process. This graph helps us to understand that. It shows cost on the y-axis as a company's limiting resource. But you can think of our limiting resource as time, right? Six weeks until the first competition is coming around the corner. Once we get into production of our robot, if we then find a critical failure, we will have wasted a great deal of our time. If it's not until drive team is driving it around, we've lost a lot of time. So how do we fit Famica into our design and build process? This is a very rough version of our workflow, but it shows where the majority of Famica is going to be used. As I noted earlier, this is an iterative process that happens mainly in the design stage and helps us to engineer out the most critical problems with our design. Once we have had our first design review, there will be a number of things that will probably fall into the Famica category that will have to be redesigned. We'll have a small group Famica review and then back into a full larger design review before going through it again and again and again and getting to making parts and reviewing parts to make sure we got what we needed. Somebody mentioned that earlier and assembly and testing. So I teased you earlier with Famica Plus. And so far, I've only really talked about Famica. Famica Plus is not a subscription service like PlayStation Plus or Disney Plus. Last year, Mr. MG said to modify the industry-specific Famica spreadsheet to make it a tool that the team could use. As different people worked with it, we found that we needed a few more different kinds of actions to take. During the design process, most of our corrective actions for higher criticality items, if not all, should be a change to the design. This is an engineering change, just like in the industry. And it's the only way to make a change to the severity or the occurrence that we've applied. 
Now, if this was all that the spreadsheet did, then we would just call it Famica. Here is the plus. There will be some items that are of lower criticality, where an engineering change may make it difficult to meet another goal, such as cost or schedule. Here, we may choose to take an administrative action and add an item to a checklist. We also need to capture which specific spare parts or subassembly spares we are bringing. And finally, the spreadsheet is a good communication tool for the drive team and strategy to know what could happen and then to figure out what steps they would take. For administrative actions, this book, The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, is supposed to be one of the best out there for helping people to see how much safer, cheaper, and better a team's work output can be if they just recognize that they need a tool to help them to remember everything that needs to be done. Jake, thank you for pointing out that part of our pre-check is when we are on the field, we look to see if uh, the camera systems are working. So the extra credit homework is, can you finish reading the book before I finish reading the book? So we are now on to celebrating reducing risks. Earlier, we talked about making it comfortable for all members to share perceived risks. We talked about how a servant leader will listen and plan a course of action, which likely involves the member who brought up the concern, plus other members. When the risk has been resolved, remember to celebrate that with that member. Thank them again for voicing their concern and make sure that they know what is being done if they were not involved in the fix. Consider adding that risk and resolution to Trello demos so that the whole team can learn and celebrate reducing the chance of that risk or reducing the severity of the outcome. All right, that's it for Famica Plus and risk analysis. Next up in our workshops, we have training on vision and goal setting, which is being prepared by Mrs. Kama and Mr. Gupta. And this will be followed by the captains leading a workshop on refining Husky's mission, objectives, and goals. Now, a small handful of people make up most of the responses on the KFT. While we do not want to stifle their voices, we do want to call in as many other people as possible to provide some feedback. We appreciate hearing from you, and we want to take appropriate steps to make these workshops more useful for the team. So please take a quick moment now to schedule when you are going to leave your thoughts in the KFT, and then follow through with that schedule. That can be your own personal project that you have to run between now and the end of the week. Thank you very much for your attention today. And remember, any questions? come and see me, project manager, uh, feature project manager, or system integration specialist. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.